today we're going to talk about covalent bonding, specifically the Lewis structures of the covalent bonding. Previously we looked at how bonding works with ionic compounds. So when you're sharing your electrons, you've got a covalent bond. Whenever you're stealing an electron, a cation loses its electron and the anion steals it. That's your ionic bond. So previously we looked at forming ionic compounds via the crossing of charges. Today we're going to look at how do you form a Lewis structure whenever you're working with a covalent bond. So first of all, let's review ionization energy. Ionization energy is the opposite of electronegativity, so it's larger in the top right hand corner and it's lower in the bottom left hand corner. If you have a large ionization energy, you require a lot of energy to remove an electron. It also means you have a strong pull on the electron, whereas lower electronegativity is the opposite. So what happens when both elements have a strong pull on the electron, so they both have a high electronegativity. What's going to essentially happen is they're both pulling so hard on it that it's going to form a covalent bond because no longer is one of them just going to let go of the rope, if you will, and let the other one take the electron. They're both pulling equally on that rope. It's tug of war where both sides are equally matched or almost equally matched where it makes a pretty good competition. And so instead of just one handing over the electrons to the other, they decide let's form a truce and let's share them. They may share the electrons unequally, but they're still sharing them. So in doing that then, let's make a Lewis structure that's going to attempt to describe how the electrons are shared in a covalent bond. Or basically, whenever they lost or gained an ionic bond, that's also a Lewis structure. But today we're not going to focus on that last part, the part about the ionic bond, because we're going to focus only on covalent bonds today. Remember, atoms want to be stable, and stability means having the same electron configuration as a noble gas. So if you have an electron configuration that's the same as a noble gas, that means you have a full octet, and chances are you have eight electrons in the outer shell. There are exceptions to that. Remember, hydrogen, for instance, in order for it to be stable, how many electrons does it need to have? Two. If you try and throw eight electrons into hydrogen, that's not going to work. So for hydrogen, to have either two electrons or to have zero electrons, that's stable for them. So making a Lewis structure for a covalent compound, it looks something like what we see in this bottom right hand corner. So we're going to discuss how we know this is the Lewis structure for a carbon when it's attached to four hydrogen and how we know it looks like this. That's our point of today's lecture. All right, so electronegativity is really important when we're looking at Lewis structures. Why? Because whenever you draw like that CH4, the least electronegative atom goes in the center with one exception, hydrogen. Hydrogen, if we look, it's got electronegativity of 2.1, whereas carbon has an electronegative of 2.5. So based on those rules, hydrogen should go in the middle because carbon is higher, has a greater electronegativity than hydrogen. But hydrogen can only ever form one bond. Because of that, and we'll look at why in a second, because of that, it never, ever, ever, ever goes in the middle. So if you ever try to put hydrogen in the middle and connect it to two other atoms, you know that that is so wrong. Okay, so never, ever, ever try to put hydrogen in the middle. Choose which other, either, which, choose a different atom with the lowest electronegativity of all the other atoms in the compound and put that one in the middle. The other rules, everything wants to have eight electrons with a few exceptions. Hydrogen is the one we already talked about. It wants two, max. Okay, So keep that in mind as you're doing it because that's kind of the main important thing. The idea is the ones on the outside of the compound have a higher electronegativity because they're pulling electrons more, so they're not as good at sharing. And so the more electronegative something is, the more on the outside of a compound it's going to naturally be situated. All right, so remember, you can represent the valence electrons of any atom with dots. So consider oxygen. We did this before when we were looking at, at ionic compounds. It has six valence electrons, 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. So we can represent it with six dots, okay? One, two, three, four, five, six. Remember, we also kind of showed oxygen, O2 minus, as an ion, looking like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, with a two minus charge. Okay, that's what happens if it forms an ionic compound. If it forms a covalent compound, it stays 
like this with six dots. So keep that in mind that there is a difference between the ionic form of oxygen and the elemental form of oxygen. We're working, when you're working with covalent compounds, you're working with its elemental form, what you see here. What about silicon? What does it look like? So let's go back to our periodic table. This one will work. Silicon. It is right here on our periodic table. So what does that mean? It has, it's in the third row, so it should have 3s2, 3p2 should be its configuration. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p2. So if you write silicon, you would write silicon with four electrons on the outer shell. And that would be the valence draught structure. Now the idea behind covalent bonding is that any time you have an open space to add an electron in, so let me change my color of my pen, you could form a bond, meaning that's, that's not, that electron has a space next to it, that one has a space next to it, there are two spaces here. So do you know how many bonds silicon can form? Four. How many bonds could oxygen form? It could form two, okay, as it is right there. So kind of the idea here is, is these valence electrons, a covalent bond is when an electron is shared. So that means it has to have one electron to give up in order to share it with another. If you have a relationship where it's all give and no take, or all take and no give, that's unhealthy. It's the same way with atoms. Atoms need to have an electron in order to share one. They have an electron to share one. Has an electron to share one. Has an electron to share one. And that's what enables these elements to form bonds. And so every opening that they have, so every electron that they're deficient, they can turn into a bond. And so that's why everything in the middle, and especially, you know, your silicon, your oxygen, your carbon, those form great covalent bonding. All right, so let's look and see how we represent this then. A single line, so these lines that you see right here, those represent two electrons that are shared. That's considered one bond. So how does this work? So with hydrogen, we have one electron. With carbon, we have four electrons on its outer shell. So just as with before, we had we have a whole bunch of openings where carbon could accept electrons and every hydrogen could accept electrons. So what essentially happens is this electron can fill this hole and at the same time this one fills this hole. So between the two of them they are sharing two electrons in one bond. Throw another hydrogen right here. They're forming one bond. Put another hydrogen right here. One bond. One hydrogen right here. One bond. So notice that if you count up how many electrons you have overall, you have four hydrogens and every hydrogen has one electron. So total from hydrogen you have four electrons to donate. And then your carbon, there's only one of those, but it has four electrons to donate. So overall on this compound there should be a total of eight electrons. If we count them up, we find that that's true. So come over here on our, on our diagram right here. There are a total of eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And if you count our bonds, we have four bonds, which equals eight electrons. And so that's how a bonding works, is these individual elements share their electrons with each other to make it so they're more stable. Remember, that's the whole point of bonding, is to make things more stable than they already are. Okay, now if you have a double bond, guess what that means? You have two lines, 
or four electrons. So four electrons is the same thing as two lines. So this is why if you look at oxygen, remember oxygen had two openings in it, so it wanted to form two bonds. What do you know? That's what it did. So it said, I have two electrons that need partners, you have two electrons that need partners, let's pair them up, thus forming a double bond. A triple bond, guess what? It's composed of three lines. So with nitrogen, diatomic nitrogen, it has three bonds called a triple bond. Every line once again represents two electrons, so that's why you have a total of six electrons represented by that triple bond. And it's the same idea as with nitrogen, with oxygen. It had three openings on nitrogen. Both of them did. They had three electrons that needed a partner, so they just paired up their three partners. And so basically every line is going to represent two electrons. And you're trying to make it so that every individual atom has eight electrons and is happy. Because the idea of sharing is that if you look at all of the electrons that this nitrogen has, how many electrons does it think it has? Okay, every bond counts as two, remember? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this nitrogen feels the presence of eight electrons. Guess how many electrons this nitrogen feels the presence of? Eight electrons. Because of that, they both now think they have a full octet, and therefore they are content. And so basically, covalent bonding is a way of once again making atoms more stable together than they were separately. Additionally, something else to consider is that nitrogen individually only had five electrons. So there's only five electrons on this atom, five electrons on this atom. Together, if you count up all the electrons on this whole molecule, it should be 10 electrons. If you count them up, you find that that's true. So notice the compound can never have more electrons than the individual atom has. So then this is kind of my how-to guide on how to draw covalent Lewis structures. First and foremost, determine which element is the least electronegative. Why? Because that's the element that goes in the middle. The next thing is just to draw a, a skeleton. So start with one bond between all atoms. Remember, a hydrogen always, always, always goes on the outside. So just put whichever is your least electronegative element in the middle and then draw lines connecting it to every other atom that it needs to be connected to. Next, add up the number of valence electrons that you will need totally. So each element has the same number to donate as the number of electrons in its outer shell. So you can get that number from the periodic table. Additionally though, is if there is a charge on the molecule, you have to add or subtract that number of electrons. Because it just does before with like for instance nitrogen, you could only have 10 atoms, 10 element, electrons, excuse me, on the whole molecule. Why? Because nitrogen had five and the other nitrogen had five, so you can only have 10 total. But let's say you have a charge on a molecule. If you have a charge on a molecule, if it's negative, that means you've added electrons that you can disperse throughout the structure. If it's positive, then you've taken them away. And so then you can distribute this number that you have totally across all of the atoms within your molecule. And you want to distribute it in such a way that they're completely all stable meaning they all have either eight electrons or like with hydrogen it has two electrons. Form double and triple bonds as necessary to use only the number of valence electrons that you have available. If you're pulling electrons from nowhere you cannot do that and you have to just simply form double or triple bonds to make up for the absence of electrons. But you can't just pull electrons from nothing. So let's do some examples of that. Okay, water is our first example. So water has the formula H2O. So our first rule that we had to do was you want to put the least electronegative in the middle. But with water we can't do that because well, hydrogen is less electronegative than oxygen but, oxygen, but hydrogen cannot be in the middle. If there's one thing you need to know how to do by the end of this class, you need to know how to draw the Lewis structure for water. It is so important. So oxygen is in the middle. The other two elements are hydrogen, and I said just draw the skeleton, connect it. Okay, then decide how many electrons you have totally available to you. So hydrogen, there is one electron in each atom, and you have a total of two atoms. 
gives you a total of two electrons. Oxygen, you have a total of six electrons. And this is all coming from the periodic table. I do recommend refreshing your memory on this if you need it. So you have a total of six electrons from oxygen. You don't have any extra atoms, electrons, excuse me, because there is no charge. So you have a total of eight electrons to disperse. With the structure we've already drawn of H connected to oxygen, connected another H, you've drawn a total of four electrons, right? Because each bond represents two electrons. So we have four more electrons we can add to this molecule. Where do we add them? Can we add them to a hydrogen? No, why not? Hydrogen already has two attached to it. One, two, in this bond right here. Okay, and this bond right here already has two. So that means we need to put the other four around oxygen. Is that correct? Yes. How do I know? Well, this hydrogen, both hydrogens only have two electrons, which is what we want. The oxygen in the middle, how many electrons does it have around it? Each bond, remember, counts as two. So this bond holds two, the other bond holds two. That gives us four plus the four alone electrons. So we have a total of eight electrons around that oxygen, so it's happy. Additionally, we did not go more than the eight electrons that we had available. So this is the correct Lewis structure for water. What about NH4 plus? Okay, so the first is decide which one's least electronegative or which one is not hydrogen and draw the skeleton. Next, decide how many electrons you have available. So hydrogen has one electron times four atoms gives us four electrons from hydrogen. Nitrogen has a total of, if we go look at the periodic table, here we'll go back and just look at it just to make sure. Nitrogen is in this period so one electron, two electrons, three electrons, four, and five. So it has five electrons in its outer shell. It looks like this one. So it has five electrons to donate times one atom. Gives it one electron. And then, here's the key. It has a positive one charge, so that means minus one electron because it lost one. So it has a total of, whoops, that should be a five. So I should have a total of eight electrons dispersed around this whole compound. Is that how many I have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, correct. Now the last key, which I hadn't told you yet, that if it, the whole molecule has the charge around it, put brackets around the whole molecule and just put the charge outside of it. So what's the Lewis structure for NH4 plus? It looks just like this. Okay, so that's the Lewis structure for NH4+. What about CH4? Once again, pick the least electronegative or the non-hydrogen, put it in the middle. Then count up how many electrons you have available. Carbon has four electrons in the outer shell, times one atom gives it four electrons. Hydrogen has one electron times four atoms gives it four electrons for a total of eight electrons and that's how many we have. So CH4, that's its structure. Okay, and N2 we already did an example of so I'm not going to worry about drawing that one for you again. But bromine, bromide now, Br2. So we've got B connected to bromine connected to bromine. Bromine is a halogen, so we've got bromine has seven electrons in its outer shell times two atoms. So we have a total of 14 electrons to disperse across this whole, um, this whole mo molecule. So we've already got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 11, 12, 13, 14. We have 14 electrons, so we're good. 
Now what about, we'll go ahead and do nitrogen just to reiterate that how to do it if you've got double or triple bonds. So with nitrogen you've got N connected to N and with nitrogen has five electrons times two atoms for a total of ten electrons dispersed throughout this whole molecule. So how you know you had to add more bonds to this was because if we add ten electrons it already has two three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. If we just added them with a single bond, nitrogen needs to have, the one on the right hand side, needs to have four more in order to be happy. So since it's not going to be happy, you have to erase two of them and add some more. So what about that? How did that do it? So now if I draw it with the double bond, that means this nitrogen on the right has eight electrons, the one on the left has eight electrons, but how many electrons do I have total? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I have twelve electrons on there as drawn, so that can't be right. So since I have too many drawn on here, I have to add another bond, and then I have to erase some of the electrons I've already drawn. I'll just draw it like this, just to make it pretty. Okay, so now I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight on both atoms. In total, I have six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And so that's the correct Lewis structure for nitrogen. Okay. All right, now I wanted to talk a little bit about the exceptions because I mentioned there were a couple exceptions. So like I said before, all elements want eight electrons in your valence, but these are the exceptions. Hydrogen, I said before, only gets two. Boron and aluminum can be happy with six. So BH3, for instance, it has a structure that looks like this. Is it happy? It is, actually. It doesn't have to have eight it can be happy with six. And then sulfur and phosphorus, those can have more than eight and still be happy. And that's called an expanded octet. And basically, we're not gonna go too deep into what an expanded octet means, but basically any elements that have a three P or higher energy levels can also have expanded octets. But sulfur and phosphorus are the most common. So basically the idea is, is that if you have three P or higher, that means you have a D shell and you can steal some of your d orbitals to help form bonds. Okay, but for the most part all of the bonding is taking place in our s and in our p orbitals and so that's where all of this wanting eight electrons in the outer shell comes from. Okay, so let's give these a try. Carbon tetrafluoride. I'm finally giving you some now without um, hydrogen in the outer shell. So CF4. So which one is the least electronegative? Carbon. SF2, which one's least electronegative there? Sulfur. NH3, nitrogen, okay? Now, total number of valence electrons, so meaning this is the total number of electrons that we can distribute throughout a molecule. So carbon has four electrons times one atom give me four. Fluorine has seven electrons, four atoms, to give me 28. Four plus 28 gives me 32 electrons. So I can have a total of 32 electrons on this structure. So carbon has to be drawn in the middle with fluorine on the outside. Okay, now let's just fill them all in and see if we have to form any double bonds. Eight on every single element. Count them all up. Fluorine has eight, fluorine has eight, fluorine has eight, and fluorine has eight. Carbon has eight, so they're all happy. How many electrons do I have on that whole structure? I've drawn 32, and that's how many I have. So check. Okay, so now sulfur difluoride. Sulfur should be right under oxygen, so it has six electrons times one atom. Fluorine has seven electrons times two atoms, so that gives me six plus seven times two is 14, so I have a total of 20 electrons to donate to the whole structure. Okay, 
So SF2, S bonded to F, bonded to F. And let's go ahead and just add, make it so every element has eight electrons in the outer shell. All right, how many have I drawn? So they all have eight, so they're all happy, but I don't know if I've drawn the right number or not. This fluorine has eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. 20, that one turned out correct. Okay, now nitrogen trihydrogen. Nitrogen has five electrons times one atom. Hydrogen has one electron times one times three atoms to give me five electrons, three electrons, eight electrons. So let's draw it over here. All right, I've only drawn six electrons, so I have to draw seven, eight, and there's my structure for NH3. Every one of them is happy and has a satisfied octet. So we're done with that one. All right, so just kind of to recap then, covalent bonds are represented by lines. So you start out drawing the Lewis structure, you first have to figure out which one goes in the middle, that's your least electronegative. Then you determine from the periodic table the total number of valence electrons that the molecule can have and has available. Then you realize your exceptions to the octet rule. You make sure every atom has an octet rule that's satisfied, so eight or six or two or slightly more than eight. And then you can make double or triple bonds if you need to play with it to make it work out. And basically this, figuring out the Lewis structure for covalent bonds just takes practice. And so pick, go through your book, look for Lewis structures, and just simply try and solve them for the molecule. Look at it and go, okay, how would I do this? Figure out which one goes in the middle, figure out, give them all a single bond to start with, and then if you have don't have enough electrons to make everybody happy, remove some of your electrons and turn them into bonds.